Yeah, so, so now I want to go into continuous availability. This, we've picked this one because it's really a wrapper for many of the things I've talked about. Right? All of the things we talk about in terms of data auto orchestration, uh, predictive analytics, all of those things feed into being able to deliver continuous availability. Uh, first, it's probably important to understand how our product is architected at a, at a very high level. Like most products, storage products in the market, there's this notion of a control plane where the management sort of things happen, a data plane, which is your data path, and then the underlying infrastructure, which actually is the media and, and the things that actually store the data. Uh, what is a little different about our system is this notion of the role of the control plane. Our control plane plays a much larger role uh, than historical uh, storage systems in figuring out the placement of data, doing the analytics to figure out uh, how the system is operating. So it does the normal things of configuring and managing the system, but it also is the interface for the service level objectives that are coming in through these application templates in converting those to placement maps that tell us where the data gets placed. Uh, and the ability to, as it's monitoring the system, to provide new placement maps for the data path. Uh, so the data path is kind of the brawn of the operation, or the muscle, muscle of the operation. Uh, given it's not trying to do all of this figuring out where data should go, it's simply doing, uh, placing data where the, data, the control path tells it, uh, it's very, very efficient. Uh, we have some uh, intellectual property that we'll talk about uh, called, uh, it's a lockless coherency protocol, time-based. Uh, that lets the system distribute data, even at scale, uh, very, very efficiently. Uh, and this is this notion of this 40 microsecond data path uh, that we believe is, is, a, is a leadership from a, for a scale-out system. Uh, the commodity infrastructure, this is this, the layer of the infrastructure, but there's a software layer that's associated with this as well. Uh, it does the low latency writes, so we use uh, non-volatile memory technology that's widely available in, in industry standard servers. Uh, to respond to the host as soon as we uh, get that right, so it allows us to have very good latency, uh, and then it destages that information back to the media. Uh, one of the other things that it does that's to me was very uh, innovative uh, when I first looked at this was this is the place where things like dedupe and compression and uh, snapshots happen. Uh, most of the time those happen up in the, uh, the data path layer. Uh, we've pushed that down into this notion of the infrastructure layer, and the benefit of doing that is we can develop algorithms that are optimized for the type of media that, that exists. So I might run a different deduplication algorithm if I'm using persistent memory than I would if I'm using hard drives. And we support that range of media so it lets us optimize the type of algorithms we use based on the type of infrastructure that's available to us. And then we have our, man, our, our access fabric. This is uh, how we get uh, to the system to specify the SLOs as well as our data path, uh, whether it be uh, iSCSI for block or S3. And then you see things like NFS and, and, and SQL. There's this notion of it's a data services platform. We can choose to add these additional services uh, if, if we choose to do so. And uh, we do have some plans to do, do some of those things. So the way this works is the customer specifies their storage in terms of a service level objective via these application templates. That gets converted into a set of policies, which is really the data placement uh, that is handed off to the, the uh, data path. Now, the interesting thing is those, that, uh, those maps can be handed off uh, at any time. So we can constantly give the system new maps, new placement locations uh, to, to vector the data uh, and that's what, it, what you see here is in this policy execution. It's really the execution of those placement maps. Uh, we then collect telemetry information uh, that's given back to the control plane. This is this closed loop system. And we also send that telemetry information to a cloud-based analytics platform that also uh, communicates with the control plane to develop this closed loop system that's constantly tuning and optimizing. Uh, the tuning and optimizing is best thought of as uh, happening in response to customer input a uh, customer can say, I, would, I want my application to run faster, so place that data on, on resources that will uh, deliver that. Uh, it could be in response to scaling, uh, scaling events where I've added new resources to the system, or it could be re in response to uh, failures or error recovery. So how does all this relate to continuous availability? So uh, when we talk about continuous availability, it's a little different than the industry standard way of thinking about that. Continuous availability or high availability is typically how many nines can I achieve? You know, what is my average downtime per year? Uh, 
in enterprise class storage, right, there is no notion of, of acceptable downtime. The system it operates continuously. That's the historical definition of enterprise storage, and we, pro we want to provide that as well. But there's some additions to that for what we call modern data centers. And that's this ability to, one, change my mind. I've, I've laid out my data in a certain way, and maybe I got it wrong. Right? Uh, or maybe I've added new technology. Right? Maybe I've added some Optane, uh, to some Optane servers to my system. In my most mission critical, highest performance application, I want to be able to leverage that technology. Uh, and we can add features. Uh, we could add new services. Let's say we wanted to support NFS or something like that. We could add that on the fly. Uh, those are the sort of things that most of the time are, are held separate from high availability calculations. This notion of, of changing the system on the fly, certain scalability events, those things are removed from the calculations of availability. But that's the way these modern uh, data centers operate. They're constantly scaling, they're constantly growing, they're constantly adding new tenants. Uh, and we need to make sure that we, we support that in our version of availability. So let's run through an example here. So uh, we've got a customer who selected Datera and they're gonna run a proof of concept. Uh, their application in production is gonna be a database. So say they select a load generator uh, for a database application. Uh, we've looked at the production requirements and we suggest, well, let's, let's use three hybrid nodes. So we support, again, a, a wide range of media in our system. So it could be uh, everything from Optane or uh, MV memory down to uh, hard drives and SSDs. So we support that range in this particular application we've suggested. Let's, let's use some hybrid nodes. Uh, we use the templates that we talked about earlier to create some storage. Uh, and after installation, they, they run some, some typical things. Their confidence is improving. Uh, they, uh, they go ahead and create volumes. And during that time, we do a patch and, and a software upgrade. So typical kind of things we might see in a POC. Uh, after that, the customer says, yep, that seemed to work pretty well. Uh, let's, you know, let's move on to production. So we recycle the volumes, uh, move on. You'll, you'll see there's kind of a, a progression here. Uh, they move it into production. They add an, an SSD node. Now here's, here's an important point. In uh, other existing systems out there, right, you can't add one node. You have to add a set of nodes, a cluster of nodes, a whole new uh, set of nodes to the environment. What we do is we add this one node, we do an inventory of all the resources that are available, we analyze that against our policies for the applications and say, do we need to relay out the data? Right? If we do, we, we uh, automatically can do that or we can do that at the customer's request. Uh, and so that's what you see here is our insights application, our cloud-based application is suggested, let's tune the system uh, for, for the application. Uh, this is a first example of something that most systems wouldn't be able to do is relay out that data on the fly. Uh, they add another node, uh, they add some more load to the system. Uh, and so things keep, keep moving here. Uh, we do a, a software upgrade, uh, some additional capacity. Uh, things are kind of moving along as you might expect during early production. Now the system is being scaled. So they're adding lots of new workloads to the system. Uh, goes from being a 150 terabyte system to 15 times that. Now we're at 2.3 terabytes uh, or, pe or petabytes. And so system is growing rapidly and there's lots of activity going on. Things like we tolerated a rack failure or a network failure. Uh, many systems that are out there today won't tolerate a rack failure because all of their resources are co-located uh, in a single rack. Now we go on through production for a period of time. Uh, this is kind of the steady state systems kind of grown. We've had resources and applications kind of change over time. We go through a number of adjustments, a number of failures uh, and recoveries. All of that's going good. And what you'll see here is this kind of notion of how much risk am I encouraging or uh, encountering in the operation of the system. And this is an important uh, line here because we'll make a comparison to existing architectures here, here in a minute. One of the other interesting problems people run into is when they decommission a system. Oftentimes data can be lost during decommissioning because the people who ran the system for so long or created the system are no longer available. And even important applications that are being decommissioned or data that uh, needs to be migrated to someplace else uh, can be put at risk in that decommissioning process. Uh, one of the things that we'll argue because of our ability to adopt new technology and transition data uh, is that you can uh, have a longer lifetime of, in our system implementation uh, than you would in other systems because most other systems, when you initially deploy the technology kind of generation, 
that you initially deploy with is the technology generation you're essentially stuck with uh, for the life, life of the system. If you can adapt new technology, adapt new services, it, it inc increases the longevity of the system. Isn't that, isn't that counter to the whole continuous delivery sort of model set though in some ways? Wouldn't you want to rebuild what you're provisioning anyway? So, I, well, I, so I, I, the argument goes both ways, right? It does. So I think that the question is, if you want to support legacy applications and new applications, right? Sometimes you don't get to control the life cycle of either the data or the application. Sure. And so we want to make sure we accommodate that. That's, that gives the customer the choice of doing that on their timeline, as opposed to saying, this equipment is just run out of gas, right? You're forced to do that on our timeline. And so what we're trying to do is really give the customer the opportunity to say, I want to transition those applications and those data sets when it makes sense for my business, as opposed to when the architecture, when the infrastructure gets old. Okay. So this sounds like then there's a role here for really good metadata, knowing what like what what data is where. Even though uh, the software defined process means you don't care about it as it's scaling and moving and everything. But when we get to this either decommissioning or major refactoring, maybe that's right. another way of saying it, is that knowing what's going on inside the things then mm -hmm. becomes more important. Is that yeah. It's, it's one of those challenges of any virtualized data center, right? Is you want to make it opaque as yeah. to where things are actually happening from the customer's point of view. Yeah. But from the operator's point of view, you want to give them the tools to say, here's where my, my resources are actually being deployed. Right. So this um, is also related to, I know on one of your earlier slides, so it's just setting context, mm -hmm. but where you said eventually all hardware becomes a service, right? Yep. We know that the wires right now right. are in a service, or we haven't... Yeah. Fix, we, we can't change physics as fast as we can, our comprehension of right. some of these things, is that I think what we're doing with software defined is just moving sort of the, the layer of abstraction further down the stack, mm -hmm. um, closer to the hardware, so that maybe at some point when we've got a robotic data center, the wires become a service or right. something like that, or wireless becomes faster than wired for some reason. Um, but I think that means that we also exposes us to a whole new set of challenges that I hope we get to, is that the more things become software defined, the more they become sort of driven by the data. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's forgotten in the, um, the need to innovate and make this all easier on the admins, but right. then we don't treat the data as well. You can tell I'm biased here. Treat the data as well. <laughs> Um, and so we've done the typical innovation trade-off. We've trade -off, traded off one set of challenges for another. So right. I hope we're going to talk about that at some point. Well, I think so a, a couple of things, yeah. right? Is, is one is, as the orchestration capabilities of the infrastructure gets more sophisticated, yeah. right? You can provide finer grain control, lower level, yeah. it's that yeah. move, moving things down. That's goodness, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and it, it, it allow us to match the infrastructure better to the application need, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the converse side is this notion of what about the data itself, right? Uh, more and more often, and, and it's a bit preachy, so forgive yeah, me. No, right? it's okay. More and more often, data is not used by just one application. Yes. Right? Data is used by many applications, right? And you need to provide the quality of service and those sort of things with that in mind, right? And so, and those things are somewhat in tension with one another, yeah. right? Is, is people want to fire up a container, not to run an application, but to run a microservice. Right? And that microservice, along with 20 others, might be accessing the same data. Right? How, do we, how do we accommodate that? That's, a, that's an industry, uh, industry problem. What we want to do is, is allow customers that finer grain control right, by policy, meaning that we want to set their intent. What do they want out of it, not how do we accomplish it? Right? And because most of the time, customers actually don't know how to accomplish it. Right? They, they say, here's what I want. Yeah. Right? And we force them as an industry to, to, to tell us how to do it. Right? Our system is built on this notion of specify your intent and then let the system uh, deliver that intent, even if you change your mind. And it's that, that's the key thing is people usually guess wrong because they just don't have all the information until they're actually up and running. Once they're up and running, we give them that, that additional telemetry information to say, here's how well your guess played out. Would you like to change your mind? Yes, great. Do that, and now we can relay out the data to accommodate that. Yeah, but the intent changes over time. It's not necessarily you're changing it, your mind. That's and, right. and so some data, like especially the, the vast majority of growth going forward, I mean, it's also a number, number from 18 to 25, the years, we're going we're gonna to grow like 17 zettabytes of data. And, yeah. and the vast majority of that's going to be IoT analytics type of data and copies of that data. And 
most of the time that data is sitting there doing nothing right. until it has to be done something with, and then you need a lot of power to it. So intent can be very sporadic. I mean, and you're, it sounds like you're making them choose, like even if, when you choose up front what the intent of, the, of your data is, mm -hmm. is great, but you're saying, let's you, you change your mind in case you're wrong. Do, does your insights, analytics stuff, say, okay, well, we know this stuff's going to be used at some point. How do you accommodate the, the, the sporadic intent? Yeah, so that's always, that's always a dilemma. And, and I think to summarize a little bit about what I think you're saying is the value and use of data changes over time. And it may change from I don't use it at all to I use it once a quarter or once, a, once every, you know, at some peri periodically to run some additional analytics. So its value has spikes. Mm -hmm. right, right, exactly. Uh, and so what we try to do is say, well, great, you know, we can, uh, as you start to consume data, right, from a given uh, application, uh, we can, it keeps jumping around, uh, we can make sure we stage that data, right, to, to help accommodate that spike, right? We'll store it on very efficient, you can, so you can say, for this period of time, store it on more expensive, uh, faster media, mm -hmm. right? When that value has decreased, you can say, I, I want to store it on more cost-effective media, and we will dynamically and, and non-disruptively migrate it. Uh, and then, uh, as you, but as you start to access it, we will pull it into higher performance media as we start to see that pattern, right? Even if your policy is to store it on more effective media, it's essentially caching, caching sort of techniques, but we will kind of try to anticipate that, that uh, increased value for that period of time. Yeah, and as we move on here in just a couple of minutes, uh, Nick, We'll also be talking yeah. about that intent base and the live migration, and then uh, towards the end when we talk about uh, Kubernetes, Shil Shilesh will also talk about the application intent, some of the questions that you're asking. Yep. So we can move on. Yep. Move on. So uh, I'm gonna. Uh, I went through all the animations here. Uh, the point of this slide is the things that we consider normal operations, things that we have to tolerate in a modern data center. Things like uh, adapting new technology, changing my mind around policy, things like rack failures, this notion of fault domain and, and data center awareness. Uh, those things in conventional scale-up environments or first-generation uh, scale-out environments increase the operational risk significantly and oftentimes to the point where they just simply wouldn't do it and you would have an outage. Uh, and so there's a number of things we do so that that operational risk, this, this real and perceived uh, risk of an outage or a significant performance or availability uh, impact, right? we have designed the system so that this notion of continuous operational availability through all of that right, is accommodated and even embraced, as opposed to saying, as some of those things start to happen, my risk profile uh, increases to the point where maybe I, I will even have an outage. So uh, I'm going to go through what we kind of call perpetual storage. So if you take all of these concepts and say, well, now I could essentially have an environment where I'm constantly bringing in new infrastructure, I'm retiring old infrastructure, I'm adding applications, I'm retiring applications. Really, this is a notion of the real modern data center version of as a service, right? It's a perpetual environment. From the customer's perspective, the interfaces in the, in the, uh, stay the same, right? What's going on above and below can be very, very fluid. And we've designed a system that allows this notion of replace the infrastructure as it ages, add new technology as it is available, change your applications and your workloads as they make sense, right? And you're just, from a customer's perspective, that service just continues to operate, but it gets better and better over time. 